we know what he suffered there on Calvary's cross. Remember, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. And that's the way we rejoice. You know, we rejoice in the fact that he paid the price for everything that was wrong with us. We, we joy and we, we can glory in his, his sacrificial death, his, sub, his substitutionary death there on Calvary's cross for us. He who was, knew no sin was made to be sin for us in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We can glory in that, but we can glory in the tribulation also, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5. Knowing that tribulation, what? Work of patience, and patience, experience, and experience hope. But surely, joying and rejoicing in, in living unto Him who loved us, and get, as the verse said back over there, uh, who, who, who died and rose again. You know, live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. You see, rejoicing in that. Re, and, and delighting in the fact that we, it is a privilege of ours, a delightful privilege to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, He's, uh, look at, look at uh, in fact, before we go over there, look back at Romans 6, 14 through 23, though. Romans 6, 14 through 23. Romans chapter 6, verses 14 through 23. Notice what Paul writes. For sin shall not have what? Dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under... Grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under, under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And what I'm getting at here, by the way, is what we just read in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 there, that they which live should not henceforth what? live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And what we're looking at, looking at rather in Romans 6 here is the freedom that was acquired for us through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that freedom meant, what the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ meant for you and I. It meant freedom from sin. Okay, what then shall we continue? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye, what? Were the servants of sin. You've been set free. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself, and you put your faith and your trust totally and exclusively in what He did there on Calvary's cross, you were made free from sin. You see? Notice, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But now how do we become free? But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. But you see the part there about even so now, yield your members. You see, that's something you have to choose. That's something you have to purpose in your own heart to do. You're not going to have a Pentecostal experience where God is going to cause you to do this like that. What you have to do is based on an intelligent understanding of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary's cross. You by faith choosing to yield yourselves, to yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, notice you were free from righteousness. You couldn't do it if you wanted to. Not that you wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. What fruit had ye then in those things wherever ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is what? Death. 
but now being made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Just understanding that alone and making a conscious decision to obey God rather than man is enough to cause you to joy and rejoice. To know that you're, you know, the life that you live unto the Lord is not in vain. To know, as that verse says, that you, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, what? Everlasting, everlasting life. life. For the way, and by the way, everlasting life is more than just the idea of living forever. It's that, but it's more than that. It's the character and the quality of life that you're going to live for all of eternity never having to be plagued with sin ever again. You see, you're talking about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ being truly manifested and reflected in you and through you uh, perfectly, that'll be the day. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 8, waiting for the manifestation over in Romans 8 and... Uh, Um, verse 21 is one of them. Uh, I was looking for the other one, but I don't see it. Yeah, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that's what we shall be by and by when it's all said and done. You see, it'll all be glorious, the song says. Um, but now go to Second Corinthians. Go back to Second Corinthians five. Second Corinthians five, and beginning at uh, let's begin at verse uh, fifteen again. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I asked the question, what has God obligated us to? What has God, God obligated us to do? To live unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath what? Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now notice the next few words. And hath what? Given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What is what has God obligated us unto? To live unto Him. How is that going to manifest itself? By executing the ministry of reconciliation. That He has what? Given to us. Verse 19, To wit that God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. How has God obligated us unto Himself? Christ died for our sin. And what does that mean? We should henceforth no longer live unto ourselves, but unto Him which died for us and rose again. And how would that obligation manifest itself in our life today? By executing the ministry and the word of reconciliation that He hath given and committed unto us. Verse 20. Now then, we are what? Ambassadors. Ambassadors for, not we are to be. You know, God has obligated us because of who He has made us in Christ. We ought to obey God rather than men. Um, Look at 2 Thessalonians 1. I wrote, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 1. And in fact, it's not 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. And notice what Paul said. But as we were what? Allowed of God. 
See, we ought to count the fact that we are ambassadors for Christ a great privilege and a great honor. Can you, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, you know what it would be, you know, you know what it's like for someone that you hold in high esteem, you hold in high regard, for them to come and entrust you with something, how you feel about that, how that impacts your life, how gleeful it makes you to be. Well, that's the way it ought to be for you and I, whom God has made us, we are ambassadors for Christ. I mean, that's a great honor, and that is a great privilege to have. And it ought to, it ought to be a very delightful thing to be an ambassador for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. I found the last, that, that last statement, but God which trieth our hearts. You see, um, we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than ourselves. That is, we have impulses and desires and appetites and, uh, to do things and to, to, to use our lives for our own end when we should be using it for the Lord. We ought to obey God rather than men. And there's going to be a price to pay for such a decision. You have to be willing to pay that price. We ought to obey God rather than men. You see, that's the attitude of the twelve there as they're being challenged not to preach in Jesus' name. That's the challenge for you. That was the challenge for Paul. That is the challenge for you and I in the dispensation of grace as well of coming to the place or and not just coming to the place but deciding uh, as 2 Corinthians 5 already said, henceforth, you know, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. You see, uh, at that moment you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the decision you're making. Not to, lo not to any longer live your own life because it is not yours anymore. Ye are bought with a price. Be ye not therefore the servants of men. And, I, and, and to add to that, sometimes we think, well, I'm not serving anybody. Well, be not a servant to yourself, but be a servant of Christ. You see, that's what God is after in your life and in my life, is for us to be all that He would have for you. Now, we've already read it, so we're not going to take the time to read it again. But what, when we get into verse 33 through 40 there, um, having talked about uh, the response of the apostles to the religious leaders demand that they stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ and they replied we ought to obey God rather than men uh, and then having if you notice in verse 32 as we are his and we are his witnesses and these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that what? Obey Him. Now that's a stinging rebuke to the religious leaders of Israel who thought they were the banner carriers of, uh, of God at that time. And notice how they responded to that declaration in verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Now there's a difference in being cut to the heart. Let me see if I can make this distinction here. Um, look at Acts 7 and 54. Acts 7 and 54. When they heard these things, they were what? Cut to the heart. And they what? Gnashed on him with their teeth. And if you get down to uh, verse... Uh, uh, Verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witness, witnesses laid down their clothes.